Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Kennard Levy Brown speaking. This is a special broadcast on uh, the first day of a Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. When you say it in English, uh, Sukkot means booths, and 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 the King James version many times Tabernacles. Uh, Sukkot is translated Tabernacles or booths, and so. Um, this is the first day based on the Jewish calendar. I don't play the calendar game uh, that other people are playing uh, and so forth. I stick by the Jewish calendar. It does have some uh, consistency and it has uh, been very successful at keeping the Jewish people together uh, despite the diaspora. And so we should follow that example or any example that is lines up with the Bible as far as uh, eliminating confusion. So anyway, uh, this is the first day of Sukkot. Um, this is a unique Sukkot. Uh, I know in my life I, I've never um, given or participated in the Sukkot where uh, a nuclear attack is imminent. <laughs> this is the first time in my entire life, and I'm almost 60 years old. I'm 56 years old, and I've never experienced anything like this before. So even though the world is really in a critical condition right now, we still should uh, have joy in tribulation. So <laughs> so this isn't a great tribulation, but uh, we could be headed towards some tribulation, folks. So we hopefully we won't be, but uh, it doesn't look good right now. Um, Putin right now or will, I think tomorrow, because uh, their time zone is different than ours, he's going to be consulting with uh, his military leaders uh, the Russian consul after they uh, blew up that bridge. So um, I, I don't know basically what, and no one knows what Putin is going to do next. So we, again, we have to be prepared uh, just like Noah was prepared. We have to prepare our families or if you're just by yourself, prepare yourself for the worst and hope for the best. And in the meantime, let's focus on Sukkot and, and what it represents it represents the total opposite of this. Uh, some people have talked, although this is a t uh, Sukkot is a time where we go out and tent, we prepare for the tribulation. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it even hints uh, that scenario. <laughs> uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, my friends, is a picture of the 1,000 year rule of Messiah, as I'm going to show you in the scriptures today. It's a joyous occasion. Even the Jews teach that. They teach that it's a joyous occasion. We should be thinking about um, what I was a part of this one church and, and the teacher said, the wonderful world tomorrow, the wonderful world tomorrow. That's what this all pictures. It pictures a beautiful time pe uh, when people will get along with each other, where every single human being will have that Holy Spirit in them and they will understand the uh, Torah, which is all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, all the instructions, the foundational Torah courses, Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but the rest of Torah, the rest of instructions are, are the rest of the entire Bible. And so um, that certainly is going to be taught. It's going to be taught worldwide from Jerusalem. And so this is what this day pictures. But what I'm going to do first, Yom Kippur certainly represents the time when he's going to, when Yeshua is going to come back. Um, but I'm going to tell you the rest of the story here. Uh, using the scriptures, and then we're going to go into detail about the wonderful world tomorrow, uh, how things will be beautiful, people will get along. Uh, it, it just will be a wonderful time, and the Bible describes that, and I'm going to show you some scriptures that that uh, indicates how wonderful that world would be. And so let me uh, put my glasses on here, and I'm going to get going with um, going to the scriptures. And let's go here. Let me pull the scriptures up here. What is wrong with wishing peace on Shakot? Do others have to say something good before we ourselves say it? Yeah, I, I don't understand that statement, but, it, but anyway, yeah, uh, it, yeah. Shakot is a is a peace peaceful um, time, and I, you know, I, like I said, there's been some quite a, I guess, quite a bit of false teaching uh, about 
<laughs> Sukkot being associated with catastrophe. I, I, I just don't understand that. But uh, uh, because the catastrophic uh, days, basically, uh, during the Moedim are because uh, the pictures to fall festivals, the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teror and Yom Kippur. After Yom Kippur, we have Sukkot peace on the earth so people going around teaching that Sukkot is a, an exercise of the tribulation they they need to study the bible and, and really understand what it says so anyway let's go to leviticus leviticus uh, chapter 23 leviticus chapter 23 and here is the instructions for the moedim and then we have the trumpets and then we have atonement and then we have um, the Feast of Booths right here. And the, and the master spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The 15th day of, the, of this seventh month, which is right now today, is the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of, or the Chag. This Hebrew word feast, should, the Hebrew word for it is Chag, okay, which means a feast. And then Tabernacles, this is a uh, Sukkah, okay, uh, the feast of Sukkah, and and some, uh, some and, and also it is uh, phrased as Sukkot. All right, so the feast of Sukkah. This is what this is in Hebrew, the Hag of Sukkah. Okay, for seven days unto the master, and on the first day shall be a holy convocation. So you fellowship just like you would fellowship on a Sabbath. You should do no servile work therein. And this is an interesting word. Let's take a look at the Hebrew. Uh, uh, it's avada, avada, okay, and it means labor, service, okay. So this is regular work that you would do on 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 just a regular work day. We should not be working on this day like it's a regular work day. That's what it means. Verse thirty six, seven days. So there's seven days to the festival of tabernacles. All right. Now there's another day right after it that people act like it's a part of the Feast of Tabernacles. No, it's a separate molding, and that's something we're going to discuss, all right, later on. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto the master on the eighth day. Now, the eighth day is separate from the Festival of Tabernacles. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. But it is associated with, but then again, it's separate. And you're going to understand why, because I'm going to give a teaching on Friday on the seventh day of the Festival of Tabernacles which is a, a, it's a good Jewish tradition that even Yeshua celebrated, as, I, as I'm going to show you, on Friday. Uh, and then um, on, um, actually, wait a minute. I think I'm going to do it on Sunday. Yeah, I'll do it on Sunday, that teaching on, on Hosanna Rabbah. And then on Monday, we're going to uh, focus on the eighth day, the eighth day, or Shemini Azeret. So anyway, you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, it is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work. So let's take a look at this. It's a sacred assembly. That's what it means, assemblage, okay? And you shall do no servile work therein. All right, so that is the commandment of that. And let me... Um, Let's go to this some more. It describes what else you should do on this here. Okay, here we go. Here's some additional instruction about the feast uh, of Sukkot. Also, in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And these are additional instructions. On the first day shall be a Shabbat. So it's considered like a Shabbat. And on the eighth day shall be a Shabbat. Okay. And you shall take you on the first day bowls of goodly trees and we're going to go to nehemiah to get some uh, an explanation of this in detail okay uh branches of palm trees and the bowls of thick trees and willows of the brook and you shall rejoice before the lord your god seven days and so the jews from this develop a good tradition on that i'm going to talk about that and he said you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in a year. It shall be a statue forever in your generation. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And you shall dwell in booths, okay? The sukkahs. Notice it doesn't say tents, although you can dwell in tents if you want. You shall dwell in sukkahs seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in 
Sukkot, okay? That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the master, okay? And so let's go to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, this is interesting. This is uh, actually when they gathered to read during the festival of trumpets, and then it led all the way until the Feast of um, Tabernacles here. Here we go. So the Feast of Booths celebrated. So on the second day, we're gathered together, the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, and to Ezra, the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which... The Lord had commanded by Moshe that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, go forth into the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths. So this says to make booths. And I don't think in Leviticus 23, verse four, it didn't say that. So it says to make booths as it is written. So let's go back to Levit Leviticus. So it says right here, you should, on the first day, the booths of goodly trees, branches of palm trees and all that, and you shall rejoice, okay? But it doesn't say anything about using that to make booths in this. So that this is talked about in Nehemiah uh, chapter 8. So let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 8. And so this is additional instruction. Sometimes you have to go to other parts in the Bible to get the full meaning of a particular doctrine. And this is the case here. And so uh, the doctrine of how to prepare for the festival of tabernacles. And so, and the branches of thick trees to make booths, a sukkahs, as it is, oops, let me go back. Let me go back here again. To make booths as it is written. So the people went forth and bought them and made themselves sukkahs, everyone upon the roof of his house, in the courts and in the courts of the house of the street in the street so they made it on the roofs of the house in the street of the water gate now this is i want you to understand something this is a picture of being in jerusalem so the environmental social setting here is jerusalem not chicago illinois or columbus ohio okay so let's this is what they were doing then okay and so in the street in the, in the gate of ephraim and all the congregation of them that were come out, again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of um, Joshua, the son of Nun, until the day, until that day, had not the children of Israel done so. so that's sad. <laughs> so they didn't. They did not celebrate the festival of tabernacles from the time of Joshua until that time. That's sad. And that's how, so far, they got away from observing the true ways of God. And there was very great gladness. So this is a verse I want you to understand here. You got people false preachers as far as i'm concerned and god is concerned going around teaching that this time of season is a time of season where we think about the tribulation we prepare for the tribulation and it's about tribulation no it's not this is a time of gladness and there was very great not little great gladness so this is a time of celebration i don't think any jews teach that this is a time of tribulation where is that coming from i think that's coming from just to sell books and videos okay this is not the time for tribulation, folks. This is the time for great gladness, as you can see, okay? And so, verse 18, also day by day from the first day until the last day, uh, he read in the book of the law of uh, Yodevahe, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, a solemn assembly according to the manner, okay? And so it's a wonderful time. And... It's a time of celebration. It's not a time of mourning. We already did that on Yom Kippur, uh, afflicting ourselves. Now it's not the time to be afflicted. And unfortunately, people are teaching that tenting out and being in a sukkah is preparation for the tribulation. Again, I don't see that in the Bible. <laughs> I don't see that in the Bible at all. And if it appears to be in the Bible, it's not, it's not in, in line with what he, God is commanding you to do here. We're supposed to celebrate. We should, we're supposed to have great gladness. Okay, so let me show you some additional information about this. So pull this up here. 
there it is. Okay, so this is a good website to go to uh, in regards to um, Judaism. Now, let me explain what Judaism is. Judaism is, like all religions, it's a way to understand uh, in a physical way who God is, okay? Now, Judaism, uh, people assume that everything, some people that, that are beginners, they believe everything that the Jews teach is correct. Well, Yeshua certainly didn't believe that. <laughs> he rebuked some of the Pharisees or, or the Jews or Jewish rabbis at that time of the several mistakes that they made, uh, or the few anyway, or the in between uh, mistakes that they made interpreting the Bible. So just because a Jew is saying something and doing something doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're right. But of all religions in the world, man-made religions, I would say Judaism is probably the closest uh to um what the bible says um and i would say christianity too is up there e even the, the false christianity um uh as far as uh at least they believe or understand that yeshua is the messiah uh but jews most jews don't believe that but anyway the point of the matter is uh yeshua realized even though judaism the Ju it wasn't even called judaism Judea oh, sorry it wasn't even called judaism at that time but uh, he even knew that despite that they did have a a mature understanding enough to teach people correctly now today how do you apply that today what i just said well there is value in jewish teachings i'm i'm, I'm going to a jewish website right now because it does have value but it takes years uh to be able to weed out from judaism what sh should be accepted and what is not i've done i've done this for several years so i know how to go into this and i can tell what lines up with the bible and what doesn't but when you are a beginner uh it's going to be a challenge to do that you need to be taught how to do that so I, I just hope that you pay attention to what i'm doing and and the few others that know how to do this and and uh be humble enough to want to be taught how to use jewish writings or any writings uh and, and be able to discern what should be accepted and what isn't based on what the Bible says. So anyway, he has here Sukkot. It's a very wonderful website to understand Judaism. Uh, the level is basic. On the 15th day of the seventh month, it's the festival of Sukkot, seven days for the Lord. Now, what's the significance? It remembers the wandering in the desert. So I guess that's how they get the tribulation, I guess, these false teachers uh, or these teachers teaching false, you know, but just because you're wandering into the desert doesn't mean that you can't be joyful in the desert. OK, so so it's a harvest festival. Observers is building and dwelling in a booth, waving branches and, and a fruit during services seven days. So I like the way he summarized this. The sum, the summarization of this is as far as the observance is building and dwelling in a booth, waving branches and a fruit during service. And let me explain the booth because some people are fanatical about the being in a sukkah, a, a, a sukkah. And if somebody can't be in a sukkah, then they've sinned. Well, you got to take a look at the fact that a lot of people don't know how to build a sukkah. Some people don't can't afford the materials for a sukkah. Um, some people um, have tented, and this is nothing wrong with tenting as a substitution for a, a sukkah. If you're in a situation where you can't build a sukkah. But nevertheless, the clear cut Bible command is to build a sukkah. And I know of Sabbath keeping congregations that don't even do that. I mean, they, they, their sukkah is a hotel. Okay. Is, is, is to go to a place, not their home and dwell there. All right. And so I know of a one big congregation where they offer four options during the feast. The first one, of course, is, you know, you can build your own sukkah there on their property, on their property they rent it out. Uh, you could tent. Uh, actually, it's five options, I think. And then they also, a lot of people, they have their mobile homes. That would be like their sukkah. Um, and uh, that, that would be the options there. Um, hotel room uh, could be like their sukkah. Uh, you can build a sukkah, uh, have a tent as a sukkah and a mobile home. 
Okay. And so um, he leaves four of those options because there's people that can, are because of their sick. They can't they can't dwell in a booth. Uh, they can't dwell on it all day, overnight. Um, there's other situations where the weather uh, will cause you not to be able to be in your sukkah. Uh, again, it's the season of our joy. I just read you in the scriptures that it should be a, 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 a joyful experience. Now, the beautiful thing about this, if you're able to travel to Jerusalem, the weather is going to be a, a lot nicer than it is. Uh, I know on the East Coast uh, of the United States. I know one time I attended this a, a Sukkot uh, in the Columbus area, and one night it was like 20 degrees. And so is that enjoying the festival? Is that? <laughs> no. And Jews recommend that if the weather is 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 not favorable, then you should go inside the house. Okay. So, so that I just wanted to give you uh, a, a mature viewpoint on dwelling in a booth. And, and, it, and it's different for everyone. Okay. Because everyone is scattered. It's a diaspora and it's not going to be the same for everyone, but Hey, if you can build a sukkah, do it. Okay. And dwell in it. But see, Yeshua stated in John chapter four, that woman, there will come a time that the people of Yodei Vahe will uh, celebrate the festivals in spirit and truth. What does that mean? Well, we're not going to completely be doing it exactly the way the Torah says, not because we don't want to, it's because we have certain restrictions or limitations. That's why. Like, for example, none of us can go to Jerusalem right now and, and give a sacrifice, right? A lot of us can't even afford to do that. Um, case in point, uh, there's a wonderful time. I wish I can be in Jerusalem right now and celebrate with some Messianic Jews, you know, um, but I can't afford it. So what should I do? Not try to observe the festival? No. You know, and and right now, because of the coronavirus, I'm at home. Yeah, and uh, we had a family emergency we had to take care of. And and my wife, uh, all of her days that she's going to take off for the feast are gone. So so things happen and God understands that. So you, you do the best you can. So anyway, uh, the festival of Sukkot begins on Tishri 15, the fifth day after Yom Kippur. It is quite a drastic transition from one of the most solemn holidays in our year to one of the most joyous. Sukkot is so unreservedly joyful that it is commonly referred to in Jewish prayer and literature as the Man Shem Chatininu, the season of our rejoicing. Okay. So that's, that's what it is, the season of our rejoicing. Sukkot is the last of the Shalosh, Ragalim, the three pilgrimage festivals, like Passover and Shavuot. Sukkot has a dual significance, historical and agriculture. Historically, Sukkot commemorates the 40-year period during which the children of Israel, wandering in the desert, living in temporary shelters. Agriculturally, Sukkot is the harvest festival and is sometimes referred to as the Chag HaAsith the festival of ingathering. The word Sukkot means booths and refers to the temporary dwellings that we are commanded to live in during this holiday in memory of the period of wandering. And so you don't go into the festival saying, oh, this is a tribulation. Oh, we're, we're supposed to suffer. No, that, that's not the whole purpose of the festival. The Hebrew pronunciation Sukkot is Sukkot, okay? Sukkot, but it's often pronounced in, in Yiddish to rhyme with book us, okay? The name of the holiday is frequently translated Feast of Tabernacles, which, like many translations of Jewish terms, isn't very useful. <laughs> this translation is particularly misleading because the word tabernacle in the Bible refers to a portable sanctuary in the desert, a precursor to the temple, called in Hebrew Mishkan. Yeah, I would agree that, that it should be better translated sukkah. The word sukkah, plural, sukkot, so the plural for sukkah is sukkot refers to the temporary booths that people lived in, not to the tabernacle. I agree. Sukkot lasts for seven days. The two days following the festival, Shemini Ezeret and the Simchat Torah are separate holidays. Now, the Simchat Torah, that's definitely a Jewish tradition. It's not a commanded morning. But the Shemini Ezeret is. Are separate holidays but are related to Sukkot and are commonly thought of as part of Sukkot. The festival of Sukkot is instituted in Leviticus 23, verse 33. No work is permitted on the first and second days. Well, it should be, according to the Bible, the first day. You know, so that's another Jewish tradition on the second day. Um, 
see extra day of holidays for an explanation of why the Bible says one day, but we observe two because of tradition. You can go there and look at that if you want. Work is permitted on the remaining days. So you can work if you need to on those days. OK, these intermediate days on which work is permitted are referred to as Moet or Moet as the intermediate days of Passover. All right. So but you should try if you can to keep all the days because that's what they did uh, during the Passover. And also it was just seven day, the Passover season, seven day and also Sukkot. When they traveled to Jerusalem, they stayed in Jerusalem and they and they took those days off. But I know it's extenuating circumstances where some people can't do it. So you should just keep the first uh, the first day uh, during um, the festival of Sukkot and then the eighth day of the assembly or Shemini Azeret. And then uh, if you need to work, then you work in between those days. But you should make every effort to try to really enjoy the entire festival if you can. So anyway. You will dwell in booths for seven days. All natives of Israel shall dwell in booths. In honor of this holiday's historic, historical significance, we are commanded to dwell in temporary shelters. Now, a temporary shelter could be a mobile home. It can be a sukkah, okay? It can be a tent, all right? Or it can be a hotel room. <laughs> it's temporary shelters, right? Uh, as our ancestors did in the wilderness. The temporary shelter is referred to as a sukkah, which is a singular form of the plural word sukkot. Like the word Sukkot, it can be pronounced like Sukkah or to rhyme with book A, okay? The Sukkah is great for the children. Building the Sukkah each year satisfies the common childhood fantasy of building a fort and dwelling in the Sukkah satisfies a child's desire to camp out in the backyard. The commandment to dwell in the Sukkah can be fulfilled by simply eating all of one's meals there. However, if the weather, now see, this is what, this is why you need to study Judaism at times because the Jews have been doing this longer than us, okay? <laughs> and they have a better insight uh, on how to keep uh, the Torah at times. So so here we go. However, if the weather, climate, and one's health permit, one should spend as much time in the sukkah as possible, including sleep, sleeping in it, all right? So it's the commandment to dwell in a sukkah can be fulfilled by simply eating all of one's meals there. However, if the weather, climate, and one's health permit, so in other words, if you have health issues, climate, and weather, then you can't stay, stay in a sukkah as much as possible, all right? Again, my, my wife got serious issues with her diabetes. Uh, whenever she we, we go out, she seems to have a hard time adjusting to the environment. So we, we felt it was best for her to either stay in a mobile home or be at a hotel because of that. So anyway, but it's different for everybody. One should spend as much time in a sukkah as possible, including sleeping in it. A sukkah must have at least two and a half walls covered with material. Now, here's a picture of a sukkah. Let me uh, uh, pull this up here so you can see it better here. Here we go. You should be able to see that better. All right, so you guys should be able to see that better, okay? All right, so a sukkah must have at least two and a half walls covered with material that will not blow away in the wind. Why two and a half walls? Look at the letters in the word sukkah. See the graphic in the heading? One letter has four sides. One, one has three sides and one has two and a half sides. The walls of the sukkah do not have to be solid canvas covering, tied or nailed down. It's acceptable and quite common in the United States. A sukkah may be any size, so long as it's large enough for you to fulfill the commandment of dwelling in it. The roof of the sukkah must be made of material referred to as uh, sekha, literally covering. Okay? Sekha or covering. To fulfill the commandment, the sekha must be something that grew from the ground and was cut off, such as tree branches, corn stalks, bamboo reeds, sticks, or two by fours. Sekha must be um, left loose, not tied together or tied down. Sekha must be placed sparsely enough that rain can get in and preferably sparsely enough that the stars can be seen, but not so sparsely that more than 10 inches is open at any point that there is more light than shade. The sekha must be put on last note. You may put a waterproof cover on, on the top of the sukkah when it is raining to protect the contents of the sukkah, but you cannot use it as a sukkah while it's covered, and you must remove the cover to fulfill the mitzvah of dwelling in the sukkah. And so anyway, it, it talks about buying one and so forth, and uh, you can easily buy one if you need to as well. So I'm not going to go over that in detail. So the RB Menim, okay? The four species. 
So on the first day, you will take for yourselves a fruit of a beautiful tree, palm branches, twigs of a braided tree, and brook willows, and you will rejoice before the master. Seven days. So another observance during Sukkot involves what is known as the four species, or the lulav and the etrog. We are commanded to take these four plants and use them to rejoice before the Lord, the four species, and that's right in the Bible. The four species in question are an etrog, a citrus, fruit similar to a lemon, native to Israel, in English it is called citron, a palm tree, in Hebrew, lulav, two willow trees, avarat, and the three myrtles, hadisim. Uh, it, it's the Hadassim, rather. The six branches are brown together with dry palm trees, a willow position on the left, and the palm in the middle, and the myrtle on the right. They refer to collectively as a lulav because the palm branch is by far the largest part. The etrog is held separately. When you purchase a lulav and etrog, usually through your synagogue or a local Jewish community center, yes, you can go to a Jewish community center and you can get one. With these four species in hand, one recites a blessing and waves the species in all six directions, east, south, west, north, up and down. It represents that God is everywhere and he's concerned about all human beings. Detailed instructions for this ritual can be found under Sukkot blessings. The four species are held and waved during the Hillel prayer and religious services. You may be wondering what that is. The Hillel prayer is Psalms 113 to 118. So is Psalms 113 and 118, that's the Hallel prayer. They're recited on Jewish or biblical holidays. And so the four species are held and waved together during the Hallel prayer and religious services and are held during processions around the bimma or the pedestal where the Torah is read. This is where it would be in a Jewish synagogue called the Hava Hakafat each day during the holiday. These Processions commemorate similar pro uh, processions around the altar of the ancient temple in Jerusalem. This part of the service is known as the Hashanah because while the procession is made, we recite a prayer with the refrain, Hoshana, please save us. On the seventh day of Sukkot, and we're going to talk about that on Sunday, uh, seven circuits are made for this reason. The seventh day of Sukkot is known as Hoshana Rabbah. I'm not going to get into that right now. All right, so. I'm going to stop sharing my screen there, see if there's any questions. Or no one knows. Uh, no questions here. You have a smiley one in there. Goody. All right. So I'm going to uh, talk about what's going to happen to bring about the Festival of Tagonacos, and I'm going to use the Bible to explain that. All right. So let me go back here. Get my scriptures out here. All right, so how is the Festival of Tabernacles or the 1,000 year rule of Messiah? How is it going to be brought about? Okay, well, there's several scriptures that talks about that. First of all, most people, including myself, have been in Sunday churches, okay? And I was in the Catholic church until I think 18 years old. I stopped being a Catholic. But I think even the Catholic Church may teach about the rapture or whatever. There is a rapture, folks. But many people have been deceived into thinking that Christ can come at any time. He can come in one second, two seconds, three seconds, four or five, whatever. And that's just certainly not true. That's, that's a misunderstanding of, of the scriptures. Um, let me show you. What, what's the pivotal event that needs to occur? First of all, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, signs of the end of the age. All right, so, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? So in this passage of scripture, the answer is there, if you just want to believe what the Bible says, okay? So we're going to find that out. What's the sign of thy coming? So there's a particular sign that's going to let us know that he's going to come back. Of course, we don't know the day or the hour. But the Bible says we could, we can know the sign of his coming. That's what we can find out, the sign of his coming. Now, what is the, the Koine Greek or Koine uh, Judeo-Greek word for this? Let's take a look here. A token, okay? A mark. So a sign. So we certainly can determine what the sign is by watching. That's why we have to watch. So we're going to find out what that sign is of his coming and of the end of the world. 
All right, so let's take a look at this. We got to believe what he says, and it's too much, too many false preachers going around preaching, taking things out of context and deceiving people. And so you have to believe what he's saying here. And Yeshua answered him and said, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah and shall deceive many. And that is happening as I'm speaking, folks. It's been happening for thousands of years. Verse six, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Right now, we are hearing of the Russia versus Ukraine war. That's eventually, it appears, unless a miracle happens or something from God happens, or there's a great renaissance, it looks like it's going to contribute to leading to World War III. And rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. So we're not supposed to get all hyped up and upset about this. You know, we, 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 uh, we understand what's going on, but let's not get all ravved up about this, all right? For all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And some people are saying, and this is the end already. This ministry has not said a nuclear war is the end. It's not the end. We're going to find out. If we just believe what he says here, we'll see what the end is. Uh, verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. That's all happening as I'm speaking. Now, here's the frightening thing about this. All these things are just the beginning of sorrows. The beginning. And certainly the kingdom against kingdom can certainly involve nuclear war. Nuclear war is not going to destroy all of humanity, but the Bible seems to indicate that two billion people of six of eight billion people can be destroyed. And that's found in Revelation chapter six, the fourth seal. It says one fourth of the population of the earth will be destroyed. Verse nine, and this is before the tribulation. Verse nine, then shall they, the great tribulation, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. This is the tribulation here that he's talking about. You shall be hated at all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. Now, do you see anywhere in the passage where the Messiah has already come back? No, but some people, unfortunately, has been deceived into thinking that he's going to come back, whisk away everybody and uh, before the tribulation. And there's nowhere in the scriptures that indicates that, folks. Um, in verse 11, and many false prophets shall deceive, shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax full. He, he mentioned false prophets about three or four times in this passage. So that's something that we should be aware of here. But he that shall endure until the end shall be saved. And some people are going around saying, I'm saved already. No, the Bible says that you have to endure until the end, either of your life or the end of these things occurring that he's, just, he's talking, talking about, and you're still alive, and then you'll be saved, all right? Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, which shows you the two witnesses will play a role into this, until all nations, and then shall the end come. And so the gospel, this gospel, the true gospel of God, that I preach and a few others preach. Now, why do I say a few others? Because in Luke chapter 17, verse 26, Yeshua stated the time of his second coming, which is now, okay, is similar to the days of Noah. How many people actually believe God in that world? Eight, all right? And for 120 years, people heard the preaching of Noah. And only seven were converted. So similarly, you're going to have very few people on the earth preaching the truth of God on this earth, folks. Before the catastrophe. I don't. I, I hope you understand that. Several people that that appear to be teaching the truth even aren't really of God. That's what that indicates. I have a better understanding of that now. I mean, <laughs> he, he stated that the time of his second coming will be similar to the days of Noah and Lot. How many people were true believers uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah? There weren't even 10 righteous people. There were not even 10 righteous people. That's prophetic, folks. That's how bad this world has gotten. And so don't be deceived by a particular minister's tour teacher's ministry that they have several likes and they have people giving them money, buying their literature and all that. Don't be de deceived by that. 
God doesn't work. He seems to always, for the most part, works through people who are despised, people who are taken for granted, people who are lied upon, people that are falsely accused. He works through those kind of people. That's where you're going to find the truth at. You're not going to find the truth uh, by a minister that looks cute or, you know, the people he serves look cute and, and they have a spectacular synagogue, Jewish synagogue, and they're preaching and they're you know, making all this money and they have uh, people buying their literature and, and all that. I mean, that Folks, don't, don't be impressed by that. Just like uh, the prophet Samuel thought someone else other than David would be qualified to be king because of the way they look. He doesn't look at the looks. He looks at the heart. That's what God looks at. And in Revelation 12, verse 9, it states that the whole world has been deceived. Revelation 12, verse 9. And, and Yeshua stated himself that the labors are, it's not that many. It's not that many really preaching the truth, folks. You know, and the people that are, they're not recognized like they should be. But a time is coming where during the tribulation, they will. The Bible says that, you know, that then then they'll wake up, you know, then they'll, they'll realize what I'm saying. And a few others out there that's doing this, uh, they, they will take them seriously. And so anyway, now Christ hasn't come back yet now. Right. So let, let's continue on. Verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. So this is something that we have to see. That's why I highlighted C. OK, now I'm talking about all this because this is going to lead to the festival of tabernacles tabernacles that we're celebrating today all right so when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet stand in a holy place that doesn't mean a group of people that means a literal place whosoever that means a temple whosoever reads let him understand then let them which be in judea that's the west bank today flee into the mountains uh, to understand that thoroughly you need to read what josephus stated in the first century what happened in the first century during their tribulation the, our first century believers, our descendants, uh, back then, they fled to Pella, Jordan, according to what Josephus said in the first century, around 67 AD or 68 AD, okay, or maybe 69 AD, I don't know. Uh, but that is the one area where Yodevahe is suggesting that we flee. If you're fortunate enough to be in that area, you flee to the co closest mountains in the Judea area. So if, if anyone listens to this program and you're in the Judea area, you're, you're fortunate. You have direct instructions from Yodei Vahe to flee to the nearest mountains in Judea. Okay? That is a definitive um, location that you can go to the bank with, folks. All right? So in verse 17, let him which is on the housetop. Now, before I even go, I need to explain what the abomination of desolation is because there's some people that don't understand it. So let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel because he mentioned Daniel the prophet. So let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. He says, at that time, shall, what time? The time of the start of the tribulation. Shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation to that time, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered and everyone that shall be found written in the book. That means the book of life. And many of them that sleep in the dust. Here we go again with the status of death. It's not that you're aware and you see everything. Uh, the Bible says that you're asleep. And them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. In other words, they'll wake to consciousness. Some to everlasting life. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then. Verse three, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So that's our that's our future glory. Verse four, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words. And the words were shut up back then. They're not now. And seal the book to the time of the end, because we're in the time of the end right now. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That's a perfect description of the internet. We're surfing the internet on Google, and, and we're searching for knowledge. Another way to understand that is that we are living in an age of rapid transportation. Things are running to and fro. All right. So anyway, verse five, then I, Daniel, looked and behold, there stood other two 
of the one on the side of the bank of the river and the, on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Okay, so again, Yeshua said, that the question was, when would the time of the end be? Okay, so let's, let's, let's figure this out. Verse seven, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which is upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into heaven, and he swore by him that lives. Here, it's not, the focus is not a Shemitah year or seven years, folks. The focus is three and a half years, okay? Forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half. So that's what we got. To, it's three and a half years. Something's going to happen. And then three and a half years from that point, the Messiah will return, okay? And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not, then said, I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So what's the end? Everybody wants to know the end. All right, verse nine. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the 21st century. Might as well put it in there, okay? To the time of the end. Many shall be purified. That's the good news. Many's going to be purified in the 21st century and made white and try, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And it says, none, not one of the wicked will understand but the wise shall understand they won't understand what i'm telling you what is the sign that messiah is coming back okay and from the time that the daily sacrifice the daily is the daily sacrifice of the lamb of a lamb in the morning and evening and in between those sacrifices you had other sacrifices during the day from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make us set up. Now, here, God wants us to count 1,290 days. So as soon as those sacrifices are stopped, we're not even nowhere near that because there's not even an altar built, and we don't have sacrifices being offered every day. When that happens and when it stops, that's when we start counting. The Messiah is not going to come back until the three and a half years is over, folks. That's when he's coming back. So let's let's go back. He's not going to come back in 20 minutes, 10 seconds, one second, whatever. He's going to come back after that. So let's 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 take a look at this here. Let me read the rest of this. And so let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation. That's that's uh, Daniel 12, verse 1. Such as was not since the beginning of the world. That's when Michael shall stand up at this time, the great archangel. No, there ever shall be and except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved which indicates the thermonuclear generation that we're living in. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or here, believe it not. Then you, and then you can interpret this and say, hey, Christ, come here now. No. Or I, I me and my wife was in this, uh, this church group that stated that Christ came to a court case. Okay. So you don't believe stuff like that. That's a bunch of malarkey. Okay. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, oh, there, believe it not. But there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. So they're going to show you things, perhaps even heal people. But what is the criteria of a prophet of God or a even a healer of God? If, if they're healing people or prophesying correctly, but yet they're teaching you not to obey God, then they're still considered a false prophet. And many people don't understand that, but that's that's true. Read Deuteronomy chapter 13. Um, and one is insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So the deception is going to be that bad. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say it to you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it or not, you're going to have, you have people now even saying that. Christ is here. Oh, I've met Christ. I've had people lying to me saying, oh, they met Christ before and all this other stuff. I don't believe any of that. For as the lightning comes forth out of the east and shine up even to the west, so shall also. So this is going to be obvious when he comes back. That's what he's saying. 
for what's so, so this is a clue for wherever the carcass is the body is it means there's gonna be plenty of bodies that's where the eagles be gathered together what is that talking about that's talking about what's gonna happen in the book of revelation revelation chapter 19 it's called the Great Supper of Almighty. This is a different type of supper, a supper you don't want to be involved in, a supper where the birds and vultures are going to be eating the flesh of human beings. That's what it's talking about, okay? And so, so the Messiah is going to come at that time, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the coming of the Son of Man. So when is he going to come? Can he come in 20 seconds? No. Or 20 minutes? No. Let's read this. Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, of those days shall the sun be darkened. Now, this is the sign, okay, that he's going to come. All right. Uh, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the earth be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So he's going to appear at a time when what? Okay, let's go over this again. After the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So that's the sign. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the earth, heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is the this is the this is going to happen at the seventh trump. I'm going to show you this. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they'll he shall gather his elect from the four winds of the earth, from one end of the heaven, uh, heaven to the other. Now, learn the parable of the fig tree. It's not talking about Israel. Let's pay attention. Here, here's a parable. When the branch is yet tender and put forth his leaves, you know that summer is near. Okay, so that's the parable. Here's the interpretation. So likewise, ye, when you shall see all these things, what things? The things he's talking about here. Know that it is near. What? What's near? It's the time of his second coming, even at the door. So there's a progression of events that have to occur before he comes back. He told you himself. So likewise, ye, when you shall see all these things, then that is near. What's near? The time of his second coming is at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation, he's talking about this thermonuclear generation where there's 70, 80, 120 years shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, this is the passage of scripture that a lot of people misunderstand, okay? And I'm going to break this down. But of that day and hour knows no man, not angels of heaven, but my father only. But as it were in the days of Noah, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, why is he bringing up Noah for when he just said that? Let's, let's continue on here. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord come. Now he breaks it down to an hour now. I want you to notice that. He says hour. Didn't say day, he said hour. Okay? Which is a part of the day. But know this, that if the good men are here, see, you got to read it. You can't take a scripture out of context and to, to support a doctrine that you think is true. You got to look at everything surrounding, above and below, to fully understand the particular doctrine you're trying to prove. When is Messiah going to come back? So let's continue on. Verse 43. But know this that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come. Let me repeat that. If the good men of the house, had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. That means we're going to be capable of knowing what watch, not the hour, but the watch that the thief would come. He would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. We're not going to know the exact hour, but we can know the watch. 
for in such an hour. We're not going to know the hour. But we're going to know the watch. As you think not, the Son of Man comes. Now, he gives another parable. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them food in, in the right time, at the right time. Blessed is that servant, whom when his Lord, when he comes, shall find him doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, like many people are saying today. Russia and Ukraine is no big deal. And then you have Papano, whatever his name is, uh, got upset at, at uh, Biden because he said something very wise, that we're close to Armageddon. We're going to take a look at what the Armageddon is, by the way, okay? Because some, some people are confused about that, all right? My Lord delays his coming. Some people actually believe right now that he's delaying his coming. He's not, folks. Thus says the Lord on that. He is not delaying his coming. I don't see any delay. And shall began to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. Then the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. So we should be looking and expecting when we're in this time of watch. What's the time of watch? Those 1,290 days is the time of watch. But that time of watch is not going to begin until a major event occurs. When the sacrifices are stopped, then we start watching. We should be watching now, of course. But we really, if we want to, if we're still alive at that time, we want to watch when he's going to come. Then we need to watch each day of that 1,290 days. Okay. But that 1,290 days is triggered by an event, and that event is the sacrifices being stopped, the daily sacrifices, which have not even begun in Jerusalem yet, okay? So the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not, not just the day, but the hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, meaning it's going to be thrown in a lake of fire, okay? And so here's another companion scripture to this. Mark chapter 13. It gets even more specific. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Verses 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. That's the sign, folks. That he's getting ready to come back. Now, I haven't seen that. In the skies, I know people saying a blood red moon. This is this is going to happen far greater than a blood red moon, and then you're going to see other things happening too. And the stars of heaven and the meteors shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven. So when all this stuff happens, you know he's about to come back, okay? And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels to gather those who were resurrected spiritually. From the uttermost part of the earth. And then he talks about the lesson of the fig tree here. Okay. So we went over that. So we're going to go over this. No one knows the day and the hour. All right. Now, he talks about the son of man is, is a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave the service. So he pretty much said the same thing here. But he said some things. He added some other things here for us to understand. So right here in verse 34. Let's continue on here. But the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house. And gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes. At even, no, now he breaks it down here. He really specifically breaks this down. I haven't heard any, hardly anyone teach this. Let me know if you have, okay? And so when the master of the house comes, now he's really getting specific here. Now, he's talking about a day, but he's talking about at what time during the day he's going to come back. At evening, at midnight, at the cock crowing, or morning. So we're not going to know, because if we're going to be counting those days, we're going to figure out the day. But we're not going to know the period during the day when he's coming back. We don't know if he's going to come in the evening. We don't know if he's going to come at midnight. We don't know if he's going to come in the cock crowing. Or we're going to know if he's going to come in the morning. But we have to watch. Said that night he comes, suddenly he find you sleeping. 
And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. Okay, so I'm hoping you guys are getting this, okay? I hope you guys are getting this. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. It is possible to uh, accurately guesstimate or estimate, but none of us are going to know the exact moment that he's going to come back. All right? But we can kind of get a feel for when he's going to come back. That's what it means. None of us know the exact time he's going to come back during a day. But if we're counting the days, which none of us know right now, of course, but we're going to know when all this stuff happens because we'll be able to count. And the 1,290th day, what, what, what is that? When we start counting, right? Or at the 1,260th day, he's going to come back because that's three and a half years. So anyway, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1, but, uh, but we're not going to know when he's going to come in the morning, the evening, in between, whatever. We're not going to know exactly when he's going to come back. That's what he was talking about. So anyway, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly, <laughs> that's interesting, that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Now, look, what does he mean by that? How does the Bible define it? Let's let's take a look at this. Thief in the night. Because this is in the book of Revelation. Thief in the night. Let's take a look at this. Thief in the night. All right, so the thief in the night, ladies and gentlemen, according to Bible prophecy, happens during the sixth vial that's thrown out upon the earth during the time of God's wrath. So, Revelation 16, verse 12. Remember, there's six, there's seven seals. The seventh seal initiates the seven trumpets. The seventh trump, which is going to be the first resurrection, as I'm going to show you, initiates the what? The seven last plagues. This is the sixth of those plagues right now, which also can be defined as Yeshua coming as a thief in the night. Verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water, therefore, was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the whole of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Armageddon, right? Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, that he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. That's where they get that from. So what is Armageddon? What is it picture? It pictures all the rebellious nations of the world gathering together to fight the master. That's what Armageddon is. And so we're not going to reach Armageddon until all these other things that I talked about <laughs> occurs. So we're way from Armageddon, folks. Okay? But when someone mentions Armageddon, they're saying that the nuclear war is going to eventually meet, lead to the second coming of Christ. That's what they mean, okay? And so, and then, of course, the seven bowl being thrown out. Let's take a look at this, because I know most ministers don't even preach this. They don't want to scare their people. And the seven angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven, out of the temple of heaven, okay? Um out of the temple of heaven, from the throne, saying, it is done. Oh, I'll be so glad to hear that. <laughs> it is done. Verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. There's going to be a great earthquake, the greatest that ever was, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, which tells you that Babylon consists of three parts. That's another Bible study. And the cities 
of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And we're all going to know when he comes back and land his feet on the Mount of Olives because all this stuff's going to happen. And every island, so there's not going to be any islands found, no mountains, okay, and no cities, okay? It says all the cities, so no cities other than Jerusalem, I guess, okay? Uh, I guess even Jerusalem's going to fall, all right? So it will be somewhat uh, devastated, okay? Because it says all cities here. So Jerusalem is a city, right? So, um, and then it says every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. So all cities, all islands, and all mountains. So pictures this in your mind. You got to picture this. This is going to happen before he lands his feet on the Mount of Olives. For, I know it's so difficult because this has hardly ever been preached by hardly anyone. Okay. But all cities, your Bible says this. Let me, let me show this to you again. If you don't believe it, get your Bible out now and read it. Okay. It's right here. All right. And the great city was divided. That's talking about the city of Babylon, not Jerusalem, into three parts. Or the symbolic city of Babylon, okay, which is not a Bible study. And the cities of the nations fell. The cities of the nations fell. All right. And great Babylon, so that's that's Babylon, right? Came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the fierceness. So the cities fell. Write this down on a piece of paper if you need to. All cities will be wiped out. All right. All cities will be wiped out. All islands will be gone and all mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. About the weight of a talent. Let's, let's take a look at how many pounds that is. Let's take a look here. Find another translation here. If it doesn't, OK, here we go. And it's not giving me the trans. The, 100 pounds. So it's going to be 100 pounds. Hailstones weighing about 100 pounds fell from the sky on people. And this is ridiculous. This is how wicked people will be at this time. The people curse God. <laughs> I wouldn't be cursing God after that happened to me. I'd be repenting. I, I, I thank God that I'm not like that, okay? It's only because of God that I'm not like that. But unfortunately, it's going to be several people that even when a hundred pound stones are going to be falling down on them, that they're still going to be cursing God. Okay. That is going to be the mental state of most people. So picture, this is how wicked people are going to be. Even despite the fact that all cities, all islands and all mountains won't be found. This is similar to the description of Isaiah chapter 24. Let me, let me show this to you. Isaiah chapter 24. See, this is going to happen before he comes back. And I don't know of any minister that preaches this. They're probably afraid to do it because, oh, I'm going to lose money, you know. But this ministry is not about money, even though we certainly welcome your offerings and, and, and donations. But anyway, verse one, behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. This is what it's talking about here. All cities, all islands and all mountains being wiped out. Behold, the Lord, because of that great earthquake. This is a description of the sixth vial plague. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and maketh it waste and turns it upside down and scattered the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, so with the priests, with the servants, so with his master. So this is the, this, this, the description of that sixth vile plague where there's no cities, no islands, no mountains. The land shall be utterly empty. And utterly spoiled. Did it say the canard has spoken this word? No, the Lord has spoken this word. All canard is doing is preaching the word. Okay. Doesn't mean that I'm the Lord. I represent the Lord only because I'm preaching his words. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to happen before he comes back. So, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 19. Let's take a look at this. This is when he comes back and lands his feet on the Mount of Olives. And then I'm going to go to the to greatly misunderstood Zechariah 14 when he talks about eyes and stuff they think is nuclear bombs and it's not nuclear bombs, folks. I'm going to show you. It's actually God doing that, melting the people because he said he's going to judge people by fire. Fire burns people, folks. So anyway, Revelation 19, verse 1. 
And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Who do you think those people are in heaven, folks? Yeah, I want you to put in the comments who you think that's in heaven right now uh, at this time before he comes back. Saying, but before I even get into that, let me show you what's going to happen during the seven Trump. OK, uh, Revelation chapter 11. Okay, so the seventh trump, which is before the seven last plagues, okay? When the seven trump sounds, we just got through celebrating Yom Teruah, which pictures all the trumps leading to the seventh trump. And so, verse 15, and the seven angels sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So time's up for the devil at this point. Verse 16, and the four and 20 elders which sat before God and, and the seven Trump, really, that's the time of the end of the three and a half years, okay, when that seven Trump sound. And the 24 elders were sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces, and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord, O God, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and reign. And, and, the, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead. Now, how in the world can the, t uh, the dead have time unless they're being resurrected? So that's why I, I highlighted that in yellow. So the time of the dead. So for the for the dead to have time, there must be this must, must be a resurrection. And they should be judged, and that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, so the prophets will be resurrected, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And at this time, when he comes, he's going to destroy them which destroy the earth. All right? And so, Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery, which is not a mystery because it's being revealed to you today. We shall not all sleep. In other words, not all going to be dead. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. The last trump is talking about the last trump in the book of Revelation, the seventh trump. Okay, So in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is talking about the first resurrection. Okay, But this corruption must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. That means we don't have it. Verse, we don't have it yet. Verse 54. So when this corruption shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? All right, so that's going to be a wonderful time. This is also talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I think. Talks about, yeah, here the coming of the Lord. In verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or dead, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua. So that's where they're at. They're not conscious and they're sleeping in Yeshua spiritually. Will, will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the master that we which are alive and remain, if we are alive and remain at that time, until the coming of the master shall not prevent them which are asleep or dead or not conscious. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, this says seven trump, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ. So these people are dead. They're asleep in Christ shall rise first. They're not, they're dead. They're asleep. They're not conscious. And they're in Christ shall arise first. Verse 17. Then we, which are alive remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, in the clouds. And we're going to meet him in the air or in the atmosphere. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. So when he comes back, when you see that sign and he comes back, 
there's going to be the first resurrection that seven Trump. Now, where do we go from there? Some people are incorrectly teaching he's going to go immediately land on the earth at that time. No, he's not. I'm going to show you that that's not the case. So let's go to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 14. And so verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the 24 beasts or the four beasts, right? Not 24 beasts and the elders. And no man can learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth, redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women for these are virgins and this, more than likely talking spiritually virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whatsoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, the first fruits. What are we called? We are the first fruits of the spirit, right? So we have the Holy Spirit or should have the Holy Spirit in us. And because of that, if we have the Holy Spirit at the time of the second coming or at death, then we are going to be resurrected first. We are the first fruits unto God and unto the lamb. It says that here in Romans. Let's take a look. Romans 8. Okay. Verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, which most people right now don't, unfortunately, he is none of his. How do I know that? Some people challenge me on that. Well, I'm up to the challenge here. Here's the scripture that proves that right here says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Most people in the world don't have it because it sees him not, neither knows him. How? Why does it say that most people in the world don't know the true Holy Spirit of God? Well, let's find out. First John, first John chapter two. How do you know God? Okay. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keep him not commandments, which is most of most of Christianity, they don't keep all his commandments, is a liar. And the truth or the spirit of truth is not in him. So that's how I can say that the majority of people don't have God's spirit right now. That, does that mean they're going to be thrown in a lake of fire? No. They just have, have not had their chance for salvation yet. They will in the future. That's going to be explained in reference to Hosanna Rabbah, which means great salvation. So anyway, John 14, verse 7, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. Because most of them are taught that the law is done away with. How can you know God if you've been baptized by someone uh, and, and supposedly got the Holy Spirit? I guarantee you didn't get the Holy Spirit being baptized by a congregation who teaches that the law is done away with. It's impossible. All right. Um, how can they have the Holy Spirit? It's impossible. So anyway, going back to Romans 8 verse 9. Right here. But you are in, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Messiah, he is none of his. And if the Messiah be in you through the Holy Spirit, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You have to keep the commandments. The commandments are linked with you keeping the Holy Spirit and having eternal life. But if the spirit of him that raised up Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, if, meaning that, some people aren't going to have it, okay? Uh, he that raises up Messiah from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. They'll be quickened because they're going to be changed into spiritual bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. And then we're going to be heirs with him. All right, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Let's finish this wonderful story here. The pictures tabernacles here and our involvement with this great day. All right, so, and I heard from a voice from heaven, and I heard the voice of harpers, and they sung and all that, and we we're going to be singing that. These are they which were not defiled with women, they're in heaven. That's where they're at. And in their mouth was found no guile. All right, so let's go to, let's get the, more of the picture here. Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven. So let's, let's, let's figure this out. So when those heavenly signs occur, all right. That's a sign that his coming is imminent. All right. 
And so the sixth seal, the heavenly signs, and then the seventh seal begins the seven trumps. At the seven trump, that's when he's going to come back and resurrect us. Then from there, we're going to see personally the father. For what father does not want to see his firstborn sons? So we're going to go see the father because the father wants to see his first completely born children. Born to be like him, to be in his substance, to have his substance, to have a spiritual body like he does. Okay, so Revelation 15, verse one, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The wrath of God, the completion of it is those seven last plagues, which that's what we're going to escape. We're not going to be on the earth during the time when those seven last plagues are executed upon the earth. After the seventh plague is executed upon the earth, that's when we're going to come back with the Messiah and totally take rulership of the world. That is all described in Daniel chapter 7, that the kingdom is going to be given unto the saints. So anyway, Revelation 15, verse 2, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. So where in the Bible does it also mention the sea of glass and where is it located? Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And this is a picture of God's throne room, folks. And right here in verse 6, and before the throne was a sea of glass, right by his throne, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and around the throne were four beasts. So that tells you right there, when you see sea of glass, it's talking about the holy of, we're going to be in the holy of holies. We're going to be in the holy of holies in heaven, his temple in heaven. We're going to be right there in the holy of holies at the seventh trump when the Messiah comes back for his spiritual wife, which is going to be us. Verse two, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. That is us, folks. And we're going to be standing on a sea of glass in the Holy of Holies right in front of our father. And we're going to have harps and we certainly going to be celebrating. And they shall sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb, which means that the Old Testament and the New Testament is together the true religion. The song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, they have to go together. If they're separate, you don't have the complete religious truth. And they sing the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are thy works, El Shaddai, or Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways. His ways consist of Moses and also Yeshua. Together, that is God's way. Thou king of the saints, and who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that, I look to behold, this is all going on in the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven. It was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. So all of a sudden, after this was going on, everybody had to leave. <laughs> it's like the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, okay? And so, um, and having their breasts girded with, so there's some angels that actually will have linen. Okay, all right, in addition to the saints. All right, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vows full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God. I would have to say right now, he's extremely angry at this point. And from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of these seven angels were fulfilled. Okay, so, so we get all the plagues being executed upon the earth here. All right. Let me read all of them. OK. And I heard a great voice out of the temple of heaven to out of the temple saying, let me sorry, let me go back. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying 
to the seven angels. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So the first one, and this is after the seventh trump, after we are in heaven right now, we're waiting for this to be over because God promised that we were not going to be a part of his wrath. And so he can't lie. He has to fulfill. So the rapture is going to occur at the seventh trump. There is a rapture, but it's going to occur at the seventh. We're going to be raptured up into heaven. And you're going to understand why in a minute here. So let me let me get done. All right. Let me see if you guys got any questions or if you're sleeping or whatever. Oh, I guess. Oh, I got a lot of people here. All right. So. All right. So this message must be preached that heaven is not shut out. Even the evan evangelicals understand heaven's in the picture, okay? But some Torah movements don't. Now, heaven, let me explain. Heaven is in the picture as far as us being able to visit the Father and come back down to earth, similar to the angels. He says we'll be like the angels. Well, the angels can go up and down, and visit heaven and visit earth. We'll be able to do the same thing. So heaven is not going to be closed off from us, folks. So those who's teaching that, they need to stop teaching that false doctrine. So anyway, uh, let me get back. God would have no reason to avoid us at that time. If, if he's going to allow angels to visit him, why would he not allow those who the Bible claims we're going to be judging? We're going to be judging angels to see him. doesn't make any sense. So anyway, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So the first one went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men. Now this is, we're in heaven at this time, folks. All right. But we're not going to be wait three and a half years. This, this is going to happen pretty quickly here. These, these, uh, these plagues, which had the mark of the beast and them which had worshiped there. So that's the first vial. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of dead men. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of the waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous. Now, I want you to understand, at this point in time, the first resurrection has already occurred. The first resurrection has already occurred. And his wife is in heaven. And why is his wife in heaven? Well, we're about to find out, okay? Thou art righteous, O Lord, that which art and was, and shall be because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the, uh, and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth, so here's the fourth vial, was poured upon, uh, it was uh, poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given. Now, this is what it's talking about in Revelation 14, where people are going to be scorched and they're going to wish. Uh, they're going to be tormented day and night. This is what this is talking about here. They're going to be scorched with this on the sun and they're going to be burnt. All right. Because why? Let's go to Isaiah. Let's take a look at what Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says about this time. Isaiah. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. He ain't going to come with water this time. He's going to come with fire. And with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger. Now, remember that scripture when we go to Zechariah 14. I'm certainly going to go to Zechariah 14 because it has the festival of tabernacles surrounded by it. And so this is certainly a message that we should preach during the festival of tabernacles uh, about his, his second coming and the detail and specifics of it. So anyway, verse 15. But behold, the Lord will come with fire and with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury. And his correction with flames of fire. For by fire and by sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. Remember Zechariah 14 when we go uh, over that whole chapter, in particular, the plague that God is going to execute. It's going to have to have, it's going to be something, it's going to certainly has something to do with fire. Okay. And the slain of the earth, uh, the Lord shall be many. So let's go back. Let's go back to the book of Revelation here. Let me add the fourth vial, right? All right, so. So you have the scorching of the men, and then the men were scorched with great. They're getting burnt up alive here. And they blaspheme the name. And so here we go again. People are going to be so wicked at this time. They're going to be so wicked that they're going to be blaspheming the name of God. Now let's go back 
to Revelation 11. Let's understand something because I know this is hardly and never, hardly ever preached about mankind's mental state at this time. Okay. So when this is announced at the seventh trump, when he resurrects his wife, okay, the saints, the nations are going to be angry. They're going to be angry that it was announced that the kingdoms of this world has come become the most people are going to be angry. So that's the mental state of people on this earth at that time. And then, of course, the time of the dead is the resurrection of the dead, because how can the dead have time? So let's get back unless they're being resurrected. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. All right, so the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of the master which had power over these plagues. They're plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out. So the reason why, see, let's, let's understand something. He does this because he's hoping that you repent. That's the reason why he punishes. He wants you to change. And so the punishments is a great motivator to get you changed, but you can still refuse. And unfortunately, some are going to refuse. That's why it's, there's a lake of fire. But most people are going to repent because most people don't want to go through suffering. So verse 10, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues in pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains. They didn't repent. And their sores and repented not so, so they didn't want to repent again. So God's going to continue with the punishment. And the sixth angel poured out his, his vial upon the great river Euphrates. That's in the air of Iraq right now. People are wondering where those angels are chained, where they are in. Okay, you're about to find out those evil angels, some of them are near the river Euphrates. Okay. And the water, therefore, was dried up that the king, the ways of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and in the mouth of the false prophet. But they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Okay? And so all these unclean, right here, let's go to this. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water therefore was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the, the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, going forth into the kings of the earth, of the whole earth, to gather them to the great battle, the great day of God Almighty. And I just read this about the this being associated with him coming as a thief in the night. Okay? And so that kind of tells you when he's going to come back and land his feet on the Mount of Olives. And then the angel poured out his vow, this, this seventh vow, the last one, is going to be the greatest plague ever because it's going to cause the greatest earthquake. It's going to cause all the cities, all the mountains, and all the islands to be removed. Okay? All right. So let's go to Revelation chapter 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice out of heaven. And so we were talking about all the saints there in heaven. They're by God's throne right now and it says right here and a voice came out of the throne saying praise our god all ye his servants and ye that fear him small and great so the reason why folks we're going to be whisked up into heaven because we have to be officially married to the lamb all right in verse six and it's going to be a celebration in heaven psalm 45 tells you that okay it gives you another detailed description of that wedding so Revelation 19, verse 6, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. That's us. And as and, the, and we're going to have the voice of many waters, just like the Father and the Son. And as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, omnipotent reign. And we're going to be shouting that. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage. This is all happening in heaven. Uh, the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. That means we have to get ourselves ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto. So we're really being called to the marriage supper. Remember, he says, um, 
You can't get to the Father except by me. Well, this is what he's ultimately talking about, folks. If we hang on here, whether we die the next day with God's spirit or we are one of the fortunate ones to be alive at the time of his second coming, we are going to be allowed to see the top most powerful being in the universe, the Father, along with his great son. And we're going to symbolically marry, not like, you know, marriage on earth, but we're going to be associated with him as his wife, his spiritual wife. And it's going to happen in heaven, folks. That's why it's worth giving your life for this this life to be in that situation is worth it's worth dying for it really is and he said unto me right blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the lamb and he said unto me these are the true sayings of god and i fell at his feet to worship him and he said unto me see thou do it not i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of yeshua worship god for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy, meaning that we understand the prophecies or, or, or we should. And so let's recap. The sign that he's going to come back is uh, the heavenly signs. I'm going to show you a graph later on so you can visualize this. The heavenly signs. That's the sign that he's going to come back. But he's not going to come back into the earth's atmosphere to resurrect the saints into the seventh trump. When the seventh trump sound, he's going to come into the atmosphere, get us, and then we're going to all be with him. We're going to go back up to heaven to visit the Father for the first time personally. We're going to be by his throne, as I read to you in Revelation chapter 15. We are going to get married to him. All this is going to be occurring while the earth is going through those plagues, the seven last plagues. All right. And so, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture of dipped in blood, which has a little Yom Kippur in it there. And his name is called the word of God. And who do you think consists of the armies that followed him? It's a combination of the angels and also us, the saints of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses because what? Fine linen is, is the righteousness of the saints, right? White and clean. And clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It's going to be us and the angels. Verse 15, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He says that we will also rule with a rod of iron in the messages to the churches. And he threadeth the winepress. Let me explain what that is. The way that, that uh, our people back in the wilderness and even during the first century and later on made wine and made it through wine presses. They put grapes into the wine press and the grapes would be crushed and produce juice. Well, this is another parable or analogy to show you how people are going to be destroyed that don't want to submit to him when he comes back. Um, the fierceness and wrath of the almighty God. And he on his vesture and on his thigh, and I want you to notice this, a name written king of kings. So he's not going to be the only king and lord of lords. He's not going to be the only lord. So he's going to be the ruler of all the kings and lords of the earth. The kings, other kings and lords of the earth are going to be us underneath him. All right. Verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He has to be great if he's standing in the sun. <laughs> and he cried. So if an angel can stand in the sun, we're going to be able to stand in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly. So this is another supper. It's a supper that none of us should want to be a part of that fly in the midst of heaven or the sky, come and gather yourselves together into the great supper. So we already had a marriage supper. Let's talk about another supper here. Until the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sin on them and the flesh of all men, free and bond, both small and great, And, I, and but they're, they're wicked, obviously. All right. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together 
to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image, they both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remainder was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So these people are going to be wiped out. Now, is that the only plague that's going to happen? No. Let's go over Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. The spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Okay, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken and the houses rivaled and the women raped or ravished. And half the city shall go into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, let, let me explain this because there's been a big misunderstanding among evangelicals and other people that claim to understand prophecy. They look at half of Jerusalem being separated here to say that's the start of the tribulation or whatever. Okay, well, let's take a look at what Christ said about this. First of all, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. So he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem here in verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know that the abomination of desolation is near. Okay. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let, let, let not them that are in the countries enter into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things be. So he's talking about the start of the great tribulation, the sacrifices being stopped. Now, so let's, let me go back down here where he says in verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden of the Gentiles. Okay, until all the times be fulfilled. Okay, so let's go to Revelation. It's, he said all of Jews will be, will be um, taken over, not half of it. All right, I want you to notice that. And Jews shall be trodden down in the Gentile. He didn't say half of it. So let's go to Revelation chapter 11. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and then that worship. But the court which is out, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall thread underfoot the whole city, not half of it, 42 months, okay? And so the captivity of Jerusalem is not going to be just half of it. It's going to be all of it. So Zechariah 14 is talking about a different time period, all right? So behold, the day of the Lord comes, and they, the spoil should be. So this is after the tribulation. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished or raped. So when you see women being raped, you know that this is about to happen here, the second coming. And half the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, some people are incorrectly teaching. There's a big gap between Revelation, I mean, Zechariah 14, 2 and 3. There's no big gap. After this, this is going to encourage them to come back. And so at this time, we're in heaven. The marriage has already occurred. We're getting ready to come back to heaven with him when we see all this, okay? Then shall the Lord and, and the angels with him and us go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon a mile of olives, okay? Which is before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of them toward the west. And with a very great valley, and half the mountains shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains. The valley of the mountains shall reach out. Yes, you shall flee. There will be an earthquake. You already read to you about an earthquake happening before he comes back. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints. So we're going to come with him at this time. So this event is not talking about the start of the tribulation. It's talking about after the tribulation, way after the tribulation. Okay. And after the last vial is thrown, which caused the earthquake that is described here, okay? And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be 
one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass at evening shall it be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters, it's going to be living waters flowing out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one God, not all these other gods, not all these other religions, not all these different sects within the true religion. And his name shall be Achad. Okay, that's what that means. Achad, one. Okay. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate, talking about the temple, until the place of the first gate to the corner gate. So the temple is going to be still there. And the tower of Hananiel unto the kings of wine presses. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. This is not going to happen till he comes back. And this shall be the plague wherein the Lord will smite all people that have fought against Jerusalem. It has nothing to do with nuclear bombs, folks. Their flesh shall consume away. And this is when he comes back. Shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That is a burning, a destruction by fire. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great torment from the Lord shall be among them and they shall lay hold everyone on his hand of his neighbor and his hand shall rise up against his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the heathen around about shall be gathered, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, the camel and of the ass and all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. So they'll all be burnt up too. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of tabernacles. And for those who still doubt that this is not going to be a burning that's coming from God himself, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so when he comes back, the beast is going to be consumed by God's glory. And when, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. His brightness is going to be so great. You know, he shines as a sun. And so that's going to be burning up people that are wicked and don't want to obey him. So let's go back. So that's what that plague consists of. It's not a nuclear bomb, folks. And, you know, people are using the, the faulty interpretation method of um, eisegesis to put their own thoughts into the scriptures. And, you know, when you do that, uh, you misinterpret the scriptures. So anyway, go back to. So he's going to judge by fire and by sword. So the fire is going to burn these people up. And it's certainly a perfect description of what happens to you when you're burnt up. Right. When you're burnt up, this is what's going to happen to you. Your flesh shall consume while you stand on your feet, and your eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. When you get burnt up, that's what happens. It shall come to pass in that day that a great torment from on the Lord shall be among them. Let's go down here. So now this leads into the, the festival of tabernacles. So now you understand the reason why I'm reading this. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of tabernacles. And it shall be, whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon him there shall be no rain. That's how important Sukkot is to God. And it should be that important to us too. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherein the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so that's very important to understand that, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to quote another scripture if I can find it here. It's in the book of Revelation. Right. 
So right here in Revelation chapter 9, this is a part of, okay, so the uh, the sixth trumpet here, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And so there are some, some angels that are bound right now in the great river Euphrates. They have not been let loose yet. In verse 15, and the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. So there, there are some angels right now that are going to be let loose in the area of Iraq one day to cause destruction, ladies and gentlemen, to, to cause the third part of men, that's 30%. Okay? 33% of men were going to be destroyed by these four angels. All right. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out to you. So it's going to be a wonderful time, ladies and gentlemen. Revelation chapter 20 certainly is picturing the Feast of Tabernacles as well. And so the devil is going to be put away. That certainly represents Yom Kippur, him removing the problem. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid on into the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up and put a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. And I saw thrones. That's going to be us. We're going to be on those thrones. We're the kings and the lords that he was talking about that he's going to be ruling over. He's going to be, king of, he's going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto us or them. And I saw the lives of them that were beheaded for the witness of Messiah and the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his, his uh, image, neither have received their mark on their foreheads or in their hands and they lived. So we're going to reign with our husband, Christ, a thousand years. That's the picture of the festival of tabernacles. All right. But the rest of the dead live not again. So I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to focus on the feast of the Sukkot here. Look at other scriptures that, that picture it. And Isaiah chapter 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity or fairness for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And the wolf now this gotta this is gonna have to take a miracle of God right here. For the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. No wolf is gonna be dwelling with a lamb right now, folks. <laughs> so so that tells you how much things will change during the, the 1000 years, which pictures the festival of tabernacles. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion. And the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The suckling child shall play on the hole of a snake. <laughs> and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day shall there be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. For to it, it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. And in that day come, shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Isaria, the, the land of Isaria. Uh, some will be in the land of Germany as well. And from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. 
The envy also of Ephraim, that means Christians, shall depart, and the adversaries of Yehuda shall be cut off. Christians shall not envy Jews, and the Jews shall not vex Ephraim, or Christians. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them together. So Jews and Christians are going to get along together because they're all going to believe the same thing. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Isaiah, like as it was to Israel on the day that he came out of Egypt. It's going to be a wonderful time, ladies and gentlemen. I am looking forward to when God comes back. Here's another one, a, a, a Sukkot scripture. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah, Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come in the last days. We're living in the last days today. And, and this is a prophecy that the temple will be built which will trigger in time events, will further trigger in time events, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares means that people are going to go back to being agrarian. They're going to own their own land. They're going to grow their own foods. They're not going to have to depend on the grocery stores. And their spirits and the pruning hooks, nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. What a beautiful, wonderful time. It's going to be a peaceful world. People are going to get along. And Christ's first fruits, the people who receive the, the Holy Spirit first before the majority of other people will during the second resurrection. They will be given rulership responsibilities. They will also, let me show you the, the, the potential. We will also, we will judge the world. We will help the Messiah judge the world. It says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And we're going to judge the world. We're also going to judge angels. We're going to judge the world we're also going to judge angels. And here is a description also about what we're going to do in uh, Proverbs. I think it's uh, Psalm what, 148, yeah, 49, I think. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Let the saints be joyful in glory and let them sing aloud a upon their beds. So I guess we're going to have beds to relax in, not necessarily have to sleep in. But let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword. So we're going to have a two-edged sword, not in our mouth, but in our hands. And we're going to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. And so in the book of Revelation, in closing, let's take a look at all we're going to receive if we just hang in there. Okay, let's take a look at what we're going to receive. I'm not going to read the bad news here. I'm going to read the good news. Okay, so these are messages to all the churches. And so it says right here. He that have an ear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches or, or those who are filled with the spirit of God right now. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the tree of life. So we're going to have immortal life. Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So that's the first thing that we're going to get. Let's just look at the second thing we're going to get. He that has an ear. And I hope you hear. Hear what the Spirit, which is another name. The Holy Spirit is synonymous with the Messiah and God the Father. Hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. So let's take a look at this again. So what's the third thing he's promising us? What's the third reward we get? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name. So we're all going to receive new names, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. So only we're going to know that name. <laughs> so anyway, let's continue on with all the blessings uh, that we're going to get if we hold on. All right. So right here. 
So if we overcome, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them, just like the Messiah, with a rod of iron. We're going to be doing the same thing. As the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. So even as he's received as a father, we're going to receive the same power to rule over people under his authority, of course. All right. So, and then we're also going to receive the morning star, which was referring to him, Yeshua. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church itself. So, let's, let's see what else we're going to get. All right. If we hang on. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. Okay, let's continue on here. So, he that overcometh. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. So we're going to live in that holy Jerusalem, that new Jerusalem. That's where we're going to live at. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which shall come out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. So we'll have Yeshua's name written upon us. OK, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. So, here's another promise. If we hang on. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. So, we're going to share his throne with him. Even as I, as he came and he's sharing the throne with the Father. So, just like the Father is sharing his rulership and authority with him, Yeshua is going to share his authority and power with us. So, that is what we're all going to receive, ladies and gentlemen, if we just hang in there, hang in there. I know some people couldn't take it. So we just hang in there. We got to hang in there and, and do what's right. If we do what's right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a spectacular life. We are going to also be kings and lords over the earth under the authority of the Father and the Son. And we're going to be able to see people uh, change and grow with the Holy Spirit. We're going to put the Spirit in them and they're going to grow and we're going to have spiritual children along with the Messiah. That's what it's all about, folks. So just, this is what the Festival of Tabernacles is the start of the restoration of the earth, of the universe. And we're going to play a role in it. And it's certainly not a time to think about surviving the tribulation. It's a time after the tribulation. Tribulation is over. Now it's time to, to um, clean up the earth, to renovate the earth. And so we're going to play a major role in that. So anyway, we're going to talk about what's going to happen to the rest of humanity. Uh, we're going to talk about that next Sunday. Hosanna Rabba pictures that. And then, of course, on Monday, we're going to finish up on the holy day that pictures the new heavens and the new earth. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so um, for those who hung on in there, I uh, appreciate you doing that. I know it's late, but I just got off here on um, <laughs> some uh, very inspired speaking here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave here and uh, you guys hang in there. Yep. And so you guys take care. For those who are still on there, on, on here, and uh, be praying for God to have mercy on this world. And if he, if this is judgment that we are going to go through a nuclear war, which it appears that it is so far, uh, we need to all pray for each other, the strength to endure, and know that this is just this, the beginning of sorrows. And it doesn't mean the whole world is going to come to an end, but it's going to be the start of it coming to a merciful end so that we can be ruled the right way and that we can have all the blessings that should come to us by obeying. So may God bless and keep you and have a wonderful festival of Tabernacles or Sukkot. And I'll be with you again. I think my wife will be teaching the women uh, this coming Thursday at 830. And then I'll be back on Friday night. And then I'm going to give a teaching on Sunday and on Monday. So you, you guys are going to get a lot of teaching. Uh, also, I have uh, teaching on Saturday at 10 o'clock. 
a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care. Shabbat Shalom.